Good afternoon, everyone. So for our last session in here today, uh, we have Aaron. He's talking to you about ASP.NET VNet and what you need to know. So I'd like to get you, uh, all, all, everyone, to give him a nice warm welcome. So I'm well aware that I'm the only thing standing between everyone here, a potential Xbox and a pub. So hopefully this will be short and sweet. Um, we're running a little bit over time. I blame OJ. I was actually in his session. He asked if he'd run out of time. They said, you're several minutes over. I said, I really need to see what happens next. Can you hurry to run up? Shit, that's like three minutes in. Oh, three seconds in. I've already sworn twice. So we're off to a good start. Uh, also, because this is probably like the fifth time you've seen the slide today for thanking our sponsors, I just thought I'd jazz it up a little bit. But again, like events like this don't happen without our sponsors. Um, this is my second time here, and uh, thanks to thanks to all the people that get behind this event to make it happen. So I am here to talk about ASP.NET 5, or VNet as it was called when I submitted the session, and what do you need to know as .NET developers? So you might be mistaken in thinking that I'm talking about MVC 5, but that's actually not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what's coming next in the ASP.NET platform. The first important thing is that it is all up on GitHub. Everything that you'll need to write this code that I'm not writing at the moment, uh, written by the Microsoft guys, that's all at github.com slash ASP.NET. So everything that's happening that I'm going to be talking about is happening in the open that you can comment on, you can jump onto the different issue trackers. If you don't like something, you have an opinion about how something should be done, the first thing you should do is jump on in there and create an issue and say, here's what I think. Even better, send a pull request of how you think it should work. And they'll probably just ignore it, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, they've been very receptive so far. And this also plays into the, the big announcement that was two or three weeks ago at Connect, where they basically said, oh yeah, the whole .NET framework for the next like, the next version of the platform, that's all happening on GitHub at github.com slash .NET. So the first thing you need to know in terms of the platform that I'm talking about is this is a complete rewrite. They have went file, new solution, in Visual Studio, or whatever they started with because they're writing everything from scratch. So they've started somewhere, and I'm assuming it's a new solution. So while this is called ASP.NET 5, it's really a V1 product. I've been using this for a while in my own spare things, and it definitely feels like a V1 product. And that's kind of something I want you to keep in mind throughout the course of this talk and, and any time you're looking at uh, ASP.NET 5 stuff, is that while there's a 5 on the end, that's more talking about the iteration of the platform itself, and they've started again. But they haven't really ditched everything from the last you know, 14 years of ASP.NET. We've still got all of the friends that we've known over the last couple of years. So we've got MVC, we've got Web API. We've got SigmaR, we've got Razor, we've got web pages. The one thing that is not here is system.web, which means there's no web forms. Come on, there's going to be more of a round of applause for that. Thank you, thank you. Talk is up now. So we've got everything that we've, like I said, known for the last couple of years in the .NET, uh, the ASP.NET ecosystem, and what you're most likely building in, pro, uh, in projects on or hopefully maintaining existing projects that have been done in kind of the last seven or eight years. That's about how long MVC has been around. So if we've got all this stuff like MVC, Web API, Razor, all that sort of stuff, what is actually different? It doesn't sound like there's really anything different in these things. We've got everything that we've already had. So what makes it different other than the fact that it's now on GitHub? The first thing that makes this really interesting and unique is when Microsoft started working on Roslyn and then ultimately has released that. Roslyn, for anyone that's not familiar with it, it's the new c -sharp compiler that has been written by uh, Microsoft. It's an implementation of a c -sharp compiler written in c -sharp, so it's, it's finally a bootstrapping compiler, not in C++, which the uh, csc.exe currently is written in. And what's interesting about that is that when they combine that with ASPV Next, is that you don't have any build up files. I'll look at this a bit later when I bring some code and have a look at the output of that. We actually don't have build up files. And that's because they can now compile to memory. 
Whereas the compiler was previously like this executable that I had to call, or they probably bootstrapped it in some other ways for doing things like web forms and whatnot. They can now use the compiler as a service. It's just another library that they can import into the project so that they can compile things and put them straight into memory. Because what they found is that what happens when you compile? You take some code files, you pass them to the compiler, convert them into IL, and then write them out to a DLL, which then writes a disk. IS then starts up, the app domain creates itself, it then loads them all back up from disk. So we're creating this thing in memory initially, because the compiler's got to do everything in memory first off, writing it to disk, only to read it back into memory. So, instead of compiling it to disk, let's just compile it straight to memory, and then swap that through to the app domain. It's a lot faster from the testing that they've done thus far, and that is the primary reason that they've gone down this path of no longer writing things to disk. It's also very reminiscent of the way things like Ruby and Node and other of the popular web frameworks these days are working, is they don't have build outputs, really. They, they have raw source files that the runtime will load up, interprets, and then executes straight from memory. Oops. Um, the other advantage of being able to do this by being able to run everything in memory is they can do things like FileWatch. Who's used Editor and Continue and had it work? That's pretty much what I expected. Well, the new version of ASP.NET, uh, combined with Visual Studio, uh, I think they're looking at it for non-Visual Studio scenarios, but I know primarily from Visual Studio, they have a much better edit and continue scenario where you just, you're just you creating files and then saving, and it just reloads that part of the memory from the changed compiler output because it only has to reload a small section. It doesn't have to reload all these DLLs because it knows what has and hasn't changed because it's able to do a file system watcher on what's actually there. The next thing that's changed in the next version of ASP.NET is we have this thing called project.json. That means there's no csproj or vbproj or sproj for f -sharp people doing web projects. I'm sure there's like someone there. I don't see Liam in the crowd, so maybe not. <laughs> but who has had a merge conflict in a csproj file? There's people without their hands up. Either you're not using source control or you're the only person working on the project. But the primary problem with CS project files is being XML is that kind of fairly loose in the way that things can get inserted and it's actually very difficult to diff. The other problem with the CS project file is it tracks the files that are included in your project. And that's the most pain that I find when I'm doing uh, merges with uh, the other developers of my teams is that I might add a file, I might add a new controller, they've added a new controller, they've got similar-ish names because they're suffix with controller and they have a CS on the end, and pretty much every tool, diff tool just table flips and it's like, you're up to, it's up to you to work out what you actually want from this. So no longer do we have to track files. And again, this is getting back to what a lot of the other popular web frameworks are doing. So if, if you've done anything with Node or Ruby or Python or pretty much everything other than probably Java, you're unlikely to have tracked the files for a project so that you can hit F5 or the equivalent thereof to run up and know uh, what's changed. This also means that we can do things that don't require understanding of CS profile. We can run things from Sublime or Atom or any other simpler text editor without having to uh, make sure that I go back and edit the CS profile because I just needed to quickly change, I quickly add a new file and uh, then it's going to make a problem for everyone else on my team, or rename a file or something like that. The other interesting thing about the project JSON is that we're able to define the different frameworks that we want to target. I'll talk about that just in a moment, but at a high level, it means that we can target multiple frameworks simultaneously from the one web project, meaning that we can migrate a lot easier. If you've ever tried to go from NBC or ASP.net, get low level, if you've ever tried to go from, say, .NET 25 to .NET Four, that can have a whole world of pain. You can, the final thing that you can do with a project JSON is define the commands that you want to be able to run. So I keep kind of talking about Node as you know, the, a case study for some of the stuff that they've done. Who's actually done much Node development? Got a few hands up. So what's interesting about Node is uh, you can define things in their project file per se 
that you want to be able to execute, so tests, or the way you want to bootstrap your web website if you want to run on particular ports. And these are the sorts of things that we can also do from a project JSON, and we'll see some examples of that in a little bit. So I mentioned that we're able to target multiple frameworks, or more importantly, we can target multiple CLRs. So this is sort of a bit broader than just ASP.NET VNX, uh, kind of encompasses .NET VNX. And there's several different CLRs that we've got. We've got the full CLR, which is kind of akin to what we're used to day to day. It's the sort of thing that WPF will run on, uh, designed more for desktops uh, uh, development. And it's also the one that we're most backwards compatible with the, the kinds of apps that we're building and working on right now. But then there's this other CLR that they're calling Core CLR, and it is a much more stripped down version of the .NET runtime. It's not, not only is it smaller, but it's highly modular. It, this is kind of the thing with the whole next version of the, the CLR, but this is crazy modular. And I'll show you that some of the really crazy compiler errors you can get by the level of modularity that you get from the new CLRs. The other thing is it's designed for running in cloud environments. So obviously Azure being a big thing from a Microsoft stack, they wanted to be able to make sure that you're able to run things in the cloud that are very performant, that you don't necessarily need to load up 90% of what you're loading up for an ASP.NET application today. If you're doing an MVC application, you're still loading up web blocks. You're never using it. You're probably removing that video engine, but it is still loaded into memory. By making a CLR that is specifically designed for lower memory consumption, designed for running in environments where you want to take memory considerations into uh, the way you're designing your application, so particularly cloud and um, shared hosting with inside of cloud environments, the idea that you can pick and choose what parts of the framework that you want, and you've got a very small subset to really only focus on the things that you're going to need by default, makes it a whole lot easier. The final thing is that it is X by default. So this is designed to work on Mono. Mono is actually going to be included as part of the build process. I'm not 100% sure if it is at the moment. Uh, if not, it's something that they're working towards. But you're going to be able to write your ASP.NET applications on a Mac, on a Unix machine, anything like that. You, anything that you can run Mono on, you'll be capable of running an ASP.NET application on. So that opens up a whole world of opportunities. The number of talkers, uh, talks that I've seen that people have been doing off of Mac, they're probably just running boot camp anyway because they're doing Windows development. And if you're doing web development, well, it would be a whole lot easier if you didn't have to do that. If you could just spin up uh, Atom or Sublime or something like that and just write all your code straight on there, run it in a hosting environment. Damon was talking in his last talk about Owen and how you can kind of swap out the underlying host. You can do that. You can run it on Mono with, and it's actually designed for that rather than it's being sort of an afterthought as ASP.NET currently is for running on anything that is not an IS stack. So what about Web API and MVC? Is anything different going into this brave new world? So we've got controllers, we've got API controllers, the different base classes, they're in different assemblies. We've got two different route tables, we've got two different action filters. All of these things are different if you're doing a web API project versus an MVC project. If you want to share code, you end up with this kind of bastardized way of doing it where you're shelling out to generic code that you've uh, been loading up into the different kinds of handlers or the different kinds of controllers, anything like that. So we've got these very different approaches to the way that we can do what is a fairly common pattern across the two of them, sending responses. With the next version of ASP.NET, these are going to be merged, or they, they have been merged, into a single controller base class. In fact, there's not really a concept of Web API as we know it today in ASP.NET 5. You can include a new package that will do that uh, if you really want to enforce the Web API conventions, because that's really what Web API is on top of uh, MVC. It's a bunch of much stricter conventions around how you're going to do REST, uh, content negotiation, a bunch of stuff like that. But now it's going to be consolidated into a single approach, a single set of controllers. Also, this is going to be fully on stacks. So if you're in Daniel's talk if you, um, just before me, you probably now know all about Owen and how it's awesome and it's the future and all that kind of stuff. But, but that is the approach that Microsoft is taking. A generic host is what they want to target. It could be IAS, it could be 
um, a self host. It could be Apache for all that really matters. And everything that you're going to be working with in ASP.NET 5 is going to be done as middleware. So the first thing that you do with an ASP.NET 5 application is you've, got to, is you've got the opportunity to configure services. Services are things like MVC, it's your, da uh, your database connections, it's your logging frameworks, it's those sorts of things that just provide information into your application. After that, you then tell ASP.NET what components that you want to use. Like you could configure MVC but never actually use it. You know, if you didn't want it, if you were wanting to just add a whole bunch of memory that you never can consume. But you can do that. It's this clear, clean separation, whereas Owen as it currently stands today is sort of this muddled thing of a very small interface that you work with to do everything. It's now much more broken down in the ASP.NET 5 stack. The final thing is uh, the approach to Owen this time is that dependency injection is going to be a first class citizen. There is dependency injection built into ASP.NET 5, a much better approach than it's been done in the current version of ASP.NET, so we don't have these local resolvers that you have to swap out. Uh, they have a NuGet package that is a basic IOC container that you could then swap out for something more advanced if you want to write Autofac or Inject or any of those others out there. But out of the box, every service that you configure will have to be configured to be injectable that you'll have to set up some kind of a lifetime of Is it a singleton, is it transient, or anything like that? And so you're forced into that um, dependency management approach and finally forced into the ability to do unit testing across uh, your controller approach. So I've been talking for a bit of time. I don't know how long because I don't have a clock visible to me. So let's have a look at some code now of kind of what I'm talking about in the next version of ASP.NET. So I've got Visual Studio 2015 Preview installed uh, to do most of this stuff, or to do most of this stuff at the best level. You'll need a, uh, you'll need Visual Studio. Microsoft still is targeting the ability to do everything outside of Visual Studio, and I'll talk about that a bit later on. But Visual Studio will be the best place to do ASP.NET applications. It's not going to be the only place to do ASP.NET applications. It's actually a really cool um, plugin for Sublime that. It brings IntelliSense, it brings the build system, it, it does everything for you. I haven't got that installed, um, but I've seen it demoed and that looks really cool. Sublime just as your replacement for Visual Studio, essentially. So let's file a new project, ASP.NET Web Application, and we end up with two new options inside of our Web Application uh, dialog. So I've got um, ASP.NET 5 as an empty app or as a starter app. Just fire up the starter app. Um, bear in mind that I am running a preview version of Visual Studio. It's not particularly performance. Uh, that's why I am running off power because it was running really bad on battery. Uh, I have it crash somewhat frequently. Um, and sometimes it just sits there doing things that you're not quite sure what it's doing. Like right now, I've just gone find a new project and this is taking a lot longer and I'm gonna have to start dancing in a moment. Otherwise, you're just gonna kind of have this awkward silence while we're waiting for it to bootstrap. There we go. Okay, so start up, lovely welcome screen as we're used to with ASP.NET applications. And let's jump over to have a look at our Solution Explorer. So this is what it looks like now, um, pretty much the same. Now this is Solution Explorer as we're always used to uh, seeing. You notice that uh, the references has a restoring next to it. Everything in the new stack is running off NuGet. So all of the .NET framework will be coming down via NuGet. And what's just happened is I've created a new project and it is going out there and it's working out what dependencies I've got based off of the dependencies that I've defined and started downloading them, or in this case I'm just running off my local disk and importing all the various NuGet packages that I need. Let's have a look at references. I have two different uh, root nodes here and that's for the two different CLRs that I'm targeting. I'm targeting ASP.NET 5 as a CLR, so that's our uh, full CLR, if you will. And then I've got the core CLR that's defined there. Expand that out, and then we'll see like all the other dependencies that I've got. And uh, this is a cool thing about Visual Studio 2015, is that it nests these dependencies, so you don't have this wall of dependencies listed under um, Visual Studio. It's all nested, so you can see what's brought in what. So right, why the hell do I have Antler as a dependency? Who the hell is depending on that? You can find it because it's all nested now. Uh, let's jump down to my project JSON. Out of that. So this is what 
a project JSON looks like. Uh, it's got a bit of a liberty on the concept of JSON. JSON doesn't really allow for comments. Um, the Visual Studio parsers do allow for comments, just because otherwise it would get really difficult uh, to you know, put in comments. I don't know where I was going with that. Uh, let's start off with our frameworks. So, I've got ASP.NET 5.0 and ASP.NET Core 5.0. Let's just remove that one, save the file, and you'll see back here, we are restoring it. Um, but I didn't actually add anything, I removed something. Visual Studio, with our tracking that I've removed that, it's seen that I've removed ASP.NET 5, so I'm no longer targeting that framework, so it's removed all those dependencies. The reason that it does track that and knows about this information is when I compile, it actually compiles twice. It compiles once on the full CLR and once on the core CLR. So this way you can work out if any dependencies you're taking uh, into your application, you know if they're going to work in the different frameworks that you're going to be targeting. Say ASP.NET um, 5.1 comes out, so the, the next version of the CLR comes out. You can also add that as a framework target and compile for that and on your build system, on your local machine, and make sure that you're, you're testing your code against the next version. You might not be deploying there yet because you're not ready to make the full migration. You haven't done the... Uh, upgrades on your production servers. But you can still test for that right now. You can have your build system testing for that, finding the errors that you're going to have before you do your migration, before you make the decision to do the next switch. I think that's really cool, that we're going to be able to just by default compile and target everything that we want to be able to target. Let's just come back in, let it off restore. We no longer have a packages, uh, packages config that we had for NuGet. Now that's part of our project JSON. You see that here's all the dependencies that I'm taking into my application. Um, I can also do framework specific dependencies. So if I'm doing something in uh, the core CLR that might need a uh, different reference, so I might want to use a different volume framework or something like that, and take a different set of dependencies inside of core CLR and sort of override what happens sort of out of the box. That's enough of that file. Let's open up our startup. So our startup is, uh, again, the same entry point as we had with uh, Owen applications, if you're building them today. Other thing that's a bit different is that there's a couple of new methods that we can uh, add. And we can also add constructors. Um, I'm not sure if you can do Owen constructors at the moment in uh, the current ASP.NET platform, but uh, you can in the VNX platform and one of the dependencies, so this is like dependency management from the application startup. The first thing that we can get access to is the current hosting environment. So I can find out information about whether this is running in a development mode or running in production or staging or any of the environments in between and do different things based off of that. I could load different configs. I could uh, execute different uh, entry points into the rest of my application based off of the hosting environment. Uh, I won't go into detail about exactly what's happening up there. That's a bit later on in the talk. But now you see we're starting to configure some services. So this application is using Entity Framework 7. So we're configuring Entity Framework. We're saying that we want to use SQL Server. Uh, we could use a different Entity Framework backing store. We could use an in-memory Entity Framework backing store. It's actually one that they've already implemented. So uh, if you want to do unit testing, you no longer have to mock out your DB context. Uh, create some wrapper repository layers, anything like that. We can swap that out for an in-memory uh, store. Uh, similarly, you could potentially have Postgres. Uh, Liam was talking about that in his talk earlier today. Uh, someone mentioned that they're looking at that. They've heard they're looking at that for um, Entity Framework 7. But yeah, the backing store can be swapped out. And finally, we're uh, saying that we want to add a DB context name this particular thing. And then that's what's going to be available with inside of our um, basic DI framework. So jumping over to something like our, I think the accounts controller takes it. No, it doesn't. Uh, it's, it's taken by other dependencies. Anyway, um, we're setting up some identity information, uh, identity providers, we're adding MVC. So like I said, we're, we're starting to describe what our application is going to need to run. And then we get down to our configure method where we actually tell it what to load up to be able to consume routes. Like what, what is dealing with routing? So, um, You'll see here that we're using a conditional statement to check for information about the environment. If we're on the development environment, we're turning on things like um, non-custom error pages, so we can see the stack trace during a, 
uh, if an exception happens. Uh, that we're seeing, uh, we can turn on browser link if you're doing, because uh, you're doing local development, so you might want that nice feature. Again, browser link is just another NuGet package that you don't even have to include in your project. Whereas if we're not on a development environment, we're going to fall back to our standard error page. Because, uh, so normally we would set this up in the web config, but as you'll see, we don't have a web config anymore because we can't guarantee that we're running on top of an IIS host. So there's no point in a web config if we're hosting on Apache. Setting up some things like static files, and then finally at the bottom, setting up MVC routing. So it's still very familiar to what we've come to, to know from the last couple of years, just done in a slightly different way, taking a much more I want approach, much more middleware approach that everything is chained. So we know exactly at what point in the pipeline things are going to happen. If I move my MVC routes up to the top, I know that my MVC routes are the first things are going to be trying and detect it uh, by my application. Running this up does exactly what we'd expect it to do. It's going to start uh, IS Express because that's my current host. Uh, it's then going to show a lovely default page inside of uh, from um, my uh, home controller. Eventually, uh, like I said, still a bit slow because it's running on um, uh, Visual Studio Preview. But this is just a website as, as we've kind of known for uh, all the past couple of years. So we don't have web forms, as I said earlier, because we don't have uh, system web or anything like that. So we might have Razor, we have all that kind of stuff. But another thing that Microsoft has decided uh, for the ASP.NET being next is NuGet is a very good thing to send uh, DLLs to um, as dependencies. It's not very good for doing things like JavaScript or CSS, so Twitter boot, uh, using Twitter Bootstrap or jQuery or anything like that. It's not very good for that. So instead, you'll see that I've got this dub dub root folder. Uh, when I saw this, I was like, really? That's like the first thing I remember from uh, IS, uh, IS5 or something back in the day. I'm like, why is there a dub dub root folder? Well, apparently it's a popular choice for conventions inside of Microsoft. But this is now the replacement for scripts and content and all those like random folders that we had placed over. There is now a convention. It's like everything that is going to be a client side file, chuck that underneath this dub dub root folder. There's another node here, which is dependencies, where I've got things like Bower. Bower is now the one that we're going to be using to provide uh, our client-side dependencies, jQuery, Twitter Bootstrap, Angular, anything like that. Don't get that from you yet. There's much better ways to do that, and Microsoft has acknowledged that, and they don't want to try and compete with what the other web frameworks are doing. Let's, let's all collaborate and make sure that it's consistent. So we can take dependencies uh, directly via Bower as like, first-class citizens within inside the new ASP.NET stack. NPM, again, who's used the bundling minification in ASP.NET and just finds that it leaves you wanting more? Yeah, every time I use that, I'm like, where's my source maps? And I can't debug my minified JavaScript, or I have just this weird wall of script dependencies and trying to make sure that they're all done in the right order. No, none of that anymore. There's no system optimizations. Uh, package from Microsoft anymore. It's all done uh, by, they recommend you go by Grunt or Gulp as the build system for your client-side files. Again, because that's what the other web platforms are doing, don't try and reinvent a wheel. Make sure that you can be compatible. Make sure that people that can, make sure the person that is sitting there on Mac writing a Node app doesn't feel scared to be able to do a front end for an ASP.NET app at the same time. Because really, it's, at the end of the day, this is just HTML. It's just JavaScript, CSS. Uh, that we're trying to send down. Why have an entirely different tool chain? So that's the basics of what is an ASP.NET VNX app. It looks very similar to what we've got today. So it's time to get weird. There's a bunch of really cool things in ASP.NET VNX that I now want to talk about. So controllers don't need a base class. If you want to create a controller in ASP.NET VNext, you don't have to inherit from control. All you've got to do is make sure that you've got a class anywhere that is going to be loaded into the app domain that has the suffix controller. Bam, this controller, done. It doesn't even have to be in a controller's folder. It doesn't have to be in like a web project per se. It just, if it's in the app domain, there's a controller, done. You can also dependency inject things like the action resort. So if you don't want to use the standard action resolver to return new, uh, return view from your controller action, 
it's a dependency that you can inject and just replace or just completely ignore. Like set it to null in the constructor, the controller, and then return whatever you want. Uh, also, because that we're very uh, with one web API and MVC, you don't have to return an action result. You can return a string or something from a controller. Uh, what you would have thought is an MVC controller. Now. Because we don't have a web config anymore, we need some kind of a configuration system. I quickly scanned over that because I wanted to talk about it uh, now instead. Instead of having a web config, we just have a generic provider-based config system. So the default template that you get uh, if you find a new static project, it will use a JSON file, but then it will fall back to the environment variables. So you can pass in things from a command line. Uh, like we did with, uh, like we do to, to specify this is a development environment versus a production environment, and then uh, sit on top of that a JSON config, so that we can load up some different config file, uh, config variables, and overwrite what we might have got from the command line. We can then do something like load up from blob storage because we're running on Azure, or load up from JSON con uh, config dot JSON underscore two because we just copy and paste it via FTP onto our remote system and not done any kind of intelligent deployment strategy. To, to kind of prove their point when they were doing this initially as a prototype, they used ID files. Uh, it's actually one of the ones baked into the config system is that you can use an ID file for your config variables in ASP.NET VNX. Use YAML for all of that. You can use whatever you want, whatever's going to work best in the kinds of applications that you're building and then fall back so you can have just a, a staging one that just overrides the connection stream or something like that. Because we don't have a system.web DLL, we actually don't get a YSOL. You might have noticed in the code that I had up before that they said use, uh, use error page and then pass some arguments to that. If you don't do that, you don't get an error page. If an error happens in your site, I uh, can't remember what happens. I don't remember whether your host crashes completely because it's like, I don't know what to do with this anymore. Like, you haven't told me to do anything. Or it just shows nothing. I think, it might, I think it might just return you a completely empty HTTP response. So if you don't want a Y side, you can write your own. You don't have to use the out of the box one. You have to include a NuGet package if you want custom errors. By the way, also, because everything is built off of NuGet, and um, they realize that people actually want to be able to debug things that they might not have written themselves. Like, who's tried to debug the Microsoft framework and had it work? Yeah, the, the, the whole let's debug the Microsoft the through Microsoft references, I've had that work on once since it was announced for VS 2008. Instead, it's going to be a whole lot easier if we want to debug anything, like any external dependencies that we've got. So let's have a look at some of the weird things that we can do. I'll jump back to my project here. So there's a file at the very top of the solution that I didn't talk about before. It's called global.json. And what this is telling Visual Studio, uh, so this is a Visual Studio specific feature. Um, what, it's telling, what global.json tells Visual Studio is, where is the source code that this project is using residing? It's telling that there's a folder called source and there's a folder called test, so load those in. And that's what we get inside of our Solution Explorer over here. I have my source folder. If I was to look at this on disk, uh, I have my solution, I have uh, SRC, and then under that I have my project. So this is just an array, so I could go C double underscore projects, GitHub, ASP.NET, uh, ASP.NET, static files source. So what I've just told Visual Studio is that there is some source in a completely different location. It's not underneath my solution. This is the folder that I want you to find some source code in. Uh, it actually happens to be something that I'm already using as a NuGet package. But source code trumps a NuGet. And that was a lot faster than it's been in all my previous testing. But ha, there we go. That is now part of my solution. I now have Microsoft.ASP.NET.static files, which is the new get package that you use if you want to be able to serve out JavaScript, HTML, CSS, anything like that in um, in an Owen application. So let's go back to my startup, and conveniently I have a new static files. Let's start our debugger on that thing. 
Wait for it to spin up. This is where we do some dancing again. So, hit my breakpoint. Cool. Step into it. I'm now in the source of ASP.NET VNext static files. I can step in sort of as deep as I want to go and see what's happening inside of something that I've said is a dependency in my project. This doesn't have to be anything that's from the Microsoft team. This could be uh, Nudisoft JSON or it could be Serilog because I'm using that as my logging framework. I just say, oh no, here's the source code for that because I reckon I found a bug in that. I want to be able to debug it. I want to see what's happening internally. I want to put my breakpoint there. I want to hit that and actually see what's happening. Or I could do, like, as I said, you could do anything. Here's MVC. Uh, I started this up before because it takes a long time to load in MVC, but I've loaded up the whole MVC source, just like just an MVC component of it, so not hosting, not static files, not even routing. This is just controllers, controller actions, um, filters, that kind of stuff. Um, Razor is separate again, but, oh no, sorry, Razor is part of this one, it seems. But I can then come in here and change these files. So this is the App Builder extensions. So this is what is used when I do use MVC. It comes to this file. I can modify this file. I've changed it so that index is gonna be my default action uh, that it'll be looking for on a controller. I've also changed my controller so that it is index. Now, if I was to run that, just started that without the debugger, so hopefully it's a little faster. Nope, awesome, it's crashed. I found an issue earlier on today where um, one of the dependencies inside of the MVC was not even compiling, which is really fun when you're trying to debug a demo. I'm like, uh, why is MVC not compiling? Okay, cool. Uh, but I've got an error. And the reason is because it's known that the action I've executed is not uh, indexed, because that's not the one that I said would be my default action. But I didn't change my view name instead. So I, it still, it hasn't just passed these magic variables around or anything like that. It's going, well, no, no, you're saying that index is my default controller action that I should be hitting. That's the one that I've tried to hit, but I don't have a view that matches that. And like, we really don't have a white sod anymore. Now kind of a white sod. I'm not even going to do the acronym right now. But that's what we get now as an error page. Cool. All right, let's get even weirder. So let me just make a new directory and three, nope, and three. I didn't test this at all beforehand. And I don't have any fallbacks in case my demos don't work. Um, let's touch a project JSON and uh, program CS. And to prove that I don't have to use any particular editor, I'm going to be running this out of Atom. Here we go. Uh, let's create a very empty uh, package JSON file doesn't have any dependencies defined, it's just targeting two different frameworks. And now we'll go to program and uh, app. Oh, what did I call this? Damn it, I had all these like snippets and now I can't remember any of them. Damn yes. stage fright. Um, no. There we go, cool. Okay, so, whoop. No, no, I don't want to use that. No. Oh, now it's broken all my tabbing. Excellent. And we'll call this program. So there we go. We've got our very lovely Hello World console application. So you can do console applications inside of the ASP.NET VNext stack. It's not just for doing uh, websites. So kind of on the next CLR, they've, they've implemented the concept of console applications because that's very really useful and stuff. Now. The, if you're going to do things from the command line, there's two uh, commands that you'll need. Uh, one's called KVM, which is the K version manager, I think is the, what it's meant to stand for. Uh, Project K was the code name for this uh, when they first started. So KVM um, is how you actually install the new versions of the CLR. Have a look at that in a moment. And then uh, once you install a particular version of the CLR, you get K, which is the actual 
.NET Bootstrapper, basically, it's a very small C++ application that bootstraps the .NET framework. Uh, so this is just a framework running just inside of this particular console host. And that goes and runs, and this is compiling, doing all sorts of fun things, and it does Hello World at the end. Cool. Very exciting demo with the console application right there. If I go, okay, so let's have a look at KVM, KVM list. So these are all the different versions of the CLR that I've currently got installed on my machine. Uh, I was playing around this when they very first announced it, so that's what all the alpha stuff is. So that was like, that was the nightly builds that they were releasing. Uh, I have um, the version one alpha in there. I actually have two versions of the alpha. And then I have beta. But you'll see what it, what's interesting about beta is that it's got CLR and core CLR. So when you install a version of, of the CLR, you actually get both. And what I can do is KVM use default, and I specify that I want to use the runtime core CLR. So default is an alias to a particular version of the CLR, and then I want to specify which runtime of that version of the CLR. So I want to use the core CLR runtime of 1.00 beta. Okay, cool. So swap that out. Now let's K run again. And this is where the modularity of the new version really starts to get funky. So I've just got an error, predefined type system.string is not defined. I have to include a NuGet package if I want system.string. That's how modular we are now. You could do this in a web app as well, obviously. Uh, it's not just in the scope of the console application, but if you don't, uh, if you somehow manage to not include system.string but still get MVC working, you've broken it. Pretty sure MVC requires strings. Okay, well, crap. I don't have uh, uh, don't have system. I don't have strings. I don't have object. Uh, okay, okay. Well, what I probably want to do is add a dependency. Uh, actually, no, I'll just show you global dependencies. So I want to do uh, console. Yeah. No, uh, system console four. Okay, so now I've said that this application is going to take a dependency on system.console because it's doing a console read and write. That's all it's doing. But this application requires the console. It requires a particular version of the console. Now if I k-run, there we go. Because it's so modular, I have to specify that, yeah, I need a particular you get package for system.console. So you, in the core CLR, when you're running in a web application, Say on Azure, you're not going to have access to system.console because you shouldn't be running to a console in a production hosting environment. So why bother bootstrapping that stuff into memory? You're not going to need it. Excellent. How am I doing for time? I've got, like, time. Okay, let's drop back and let's make another directory. Uh, there we go. And we'll bring it here. So, uh, I'll just put this one package JSON, project JSON. Now, let's see if I can remember all of my code snippets. So, I want uh, ASP.NET. Nope. There we go. Okay, so this is kind of the basic sort of dependencies I want if I'm going to be running on uh, top of uh, IS. So I've got an IS web listener. Um, I've got IS as a particular NuGet package. or sit static files so I could render out um, HTML and stuff like that. Now I need to create a file. and call this startup.up. So yes, uh, okay, we'll call it demo. So, I want to configure some services, so services.use mvc, uh, whoops, add mvc, mvc, and then app use mvc, routes, and let's see what I'm going to do. Nope. Right. 
Ah, I used to know what I wrote as my demo code, but I don't anymore. Uh, so we'll define a route, uh, routes the map tech routes. You know what? Rather than everyone sitting here while I type and it get very awkward while I start freaking out that I'm typing things wrong and you're looking for compile errors and you're just waiting to be that way, it's, yes, I can tell you what's wrong. Let's go back to, here's what I prepared earlier. Um, yeah. Okay, so, what I prepared earlier. All right, so, Got my startup, uh, saying that I'm using MVC, I've got a default route to find, it's going to be indexed uh, on the home controller. I have a home controller that looks like that. Like I said, we don't need a base class anymore for our controllers. It's now fully convention based, that if you have a suffix of controller, that's all you really need. So how would I run this though? Like, say I'm working on a Mac, or I don't have Visual Studio installed, I don't have IS installed, I want to use a, a, a self host or something like that. Or, uh, well, I'm actually going to use uh, IS, I think, anyway. But if I want to run this without having to fire up Visual Studio, that's where, in my project JSON, the commands start coming into play. So here I've defined a command called web. It says that um, using the ASP.NET hosting uh, run to, uh, host, um, I want to start the server that is using the web listener, so the IS, and then I want to start it on a particular URL. So this case is localhost 5000. Kweb. This will start up momentarily. There we go. And if we go localhost 5000. There we go. We've hit our default controller action that is returned as just a string, because it doesn't return an action result, it returns a string that doesn't have a base class of MVC or MVC's controller or anything like that. Um, we have got a very minimal application defined inside of our own Owen stack. We have run this from the command line, which is set up an IS host. We haven't had to load up Visual Studio for any of this stuff. Um, at the moment, it doesn't work, but there plan is in the future that the editing continue will work from this kind of a host as well. So I don't have to do anything other than run a command from the command line and then open up notepad and start changing files. So you're probably thinking, I want this, I need this. But is it all that it's cracked up to be? Remember at the start I said, this is a complete rewrite. This is a V1 product. That's something that we need to be mindful of when going forward. I've built a site, uh, just a small um, site that I was uh, playing around with the idea. On top of this, in terms of the tooling is not great yet. Uh, if I was doing a new project for a client, I wouldn't be doing it on this yet. It's a V1 product. It still has work to be done. They are using the learnings of the last 14 years of ASP.NET development there is things that are really nice about it. The fact that it has such a great DI story from the ground up to the point where even the hosting environment is just an interface that you can consume anywhere else with inside of your application. That every service that you want to use in your application has to be configured into the IFC container, or so the, the DI framework. That's really nice, but I'm not sure I can convince my clients yet to do like to be this bleeding edge. They actually don't know where you can deploy this in production instance yet. Uh, heard you can get it running on Azure. It's quite a kind of difficult to get it running on Azure. You don't have website support or anything like that. It's nice, but I wouldn't be putting this into production in the next six months at least. I, will, I wouldn't even be starting a new project looking to go into production in the next six months at least. I'd be mean, looking at this in anything that I want to do to play around with on my own, but I wouldn't be pushing clients down that route. But you're probably going, okay, well, what can I do next? Like, what, what is the next step if I if I do want to use this? So I, I just built all these like really cool things up and then said, no, not for you. But what should you do next? I get the VS Next preview, uh, so the, the 2015 preview that's uh, that's out. I'm using that as my primary development environment just to, to see what it's like. I 
and at Web Project 11 or something, from just testing things, doing demos like this, seeing how it works. That way I can give feedback. I can say, hey, this doesn't work. Or have you thought about doing it this way? That kind of stuff. Finding what the pointy edges are. Looking at it from as a consumer. Yep. No. No, uh, the question was, do you need to run uh, 2012, uh, 2015 preview in a VM? No, I'm running it side by side with 2013. Uh, it's perfectly fine if you're happy to run a preview version of Visual Studio on bare OS. Not everyone is happy with doing that. Um, I'm working in a team of three at the moment. I'm the only person doing that. Uh, and I said it, it crashes enough that it's kind of annoying. And yeah, the, the tooling is fairly V1. Like, you can't do right click add controller, at least not. Um, not that I've found. So you don't have kind of this scaffolding that we've been used to from the last five, six years of ASP.NET development. Um, one thing I didn't cover off, uh, just because I haven't been able to get the demos working, I, I know it's something that's still in development of. Um, they're, they're changing the way that you're going to be able to render out uh, the form, like form fields and stuff like that in ASP.NET. So you won't have to do like HTML editor for. There's a new thing called tag helpers. Uh, like I said, that's, I believe, still pretty well in development. Um, we saw this in action. They will talk about it at the MVP summit. Um, the guy that was presenting it is the PM for web forms. And when you use a tag helper, a tag, a tag helpers, you have to just specify a syntax that, so he knows that it's a tag helper, not just HTML tag. And we're like, so what, run at server? So there's still some things that they're looking at that we could like influence and maybe not run at server for uh, for the way that we want to be able to render HTML in Razor files going forward. At the moment, it's only for C sharp. I don't think there's any plans in the roadmap for VB. If there is anyone here using VB.net, who's the primary ASP.NET development stack, sorry, I don't think that's coming anytime soon. Um, there's no F sharp support either. Uh, for the few people out there that is going to care. Uh, you can't even uh, reference things that are using the old project file system. So anything that is using a CS proj, you can't reference that in the VNX project, uh, even if you're uh, forward compatible in the way that you're writing your code. So you're not taking dependencies on things that won't be in CLR or anything like that. Uh, you can't reference them at all. Uh, if you're going to be doing ASP.NET development, start learning things like Grunt or Gulp, whichever is your choice, uh, Bower, NPM, those sorts of things are going to be very important to the way we start building web applications going forward. Uh, there's plenty of documentation out there for doing those, there, and Microsoft sees that as the replacement for building line of business applications. Uh, things like Angular are really, really good for data-driven applications, as well as really crazy UI-based applications. As I said, deployment is still kind of difficult. Um, I, the primary reason that I haven't deployed the site that I built is because I don't know where to deploy it at the moment. I haven't actually found somewhere to deploy it. Um, if you want to do this on uh, a non-Windows environment, so if you want to use a Mac or you want to use Linux or Unix or anything like that and run it with Mono, uh, that is also fairly funky still just because Mono versions in most Linux distributions are ridiculously old. I think you're going to use Mono 3.8, because they're currently going to support one, and a lot of the Linux platforms kind of support that. But that's it. Thank you. Question on the back? Yeah, so the, the question was, how do you know what dependencies to take into your application? Uh, yeah, that's that's not great at the moment because because everything is so modular. Like the fact that yeah, you don't even get system your console if you don't opt into it and you want to run a raw CLR. Uh, trying to make sure that you have the right dependencies uh, is fairly difficult. Um, the tooling inside of Visual Studio is getting better. Uh, let's just go to my JSON. Uh, not on the network, so I won't get everything, but 
you do get this sort of autocomplete list to kind of help you out. I will also do searches on NuGet. That's really only useful though if you know what package you're after. Um, there is a website that one of the ASP.NET team wrote uh, that I can't remember off the top of my head. They actually uses Roslyn under the hood to search their entire code base to work out the class that you're looking for and what dependency that's in. I think we'll see as more things be like as NuGet becomes much more of a first class citizen in the next versions of the .NET framework. We'll see better support from Microsoft in terms of discoverability. It'd be really nice if the um, you could do kind of like the Rashad Alt Enter, and it tells you, oh, have you you haven't referenced system dot uh, configuration, but using trying to use app settings. Okay, cool. Well, wouldn't it be cool if you could do something similar, and it goes, I'm going to throw that at some service to work out what you get package you need to install. Um, whether that's anytime soon, I don't know. Uh, it it is kind of Difficult. I, when I was building my site, I was like, why doesn't this work? Like, what the hell am I missing? I have no idea what NuGet packages I need to install. And like, yeah, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> but again, this is, this is sort of B1. Uh, so what, what do you actually deploy at the end of the day? Um, at the end of the day, what you'll be deploying primarily is NuGet packages. So, uh, and this is kind of why the deployment story is not great at the moment, because uh, I don't think there is a final answer to that. Uh, you can use the command line tools to generate assemblies, but the build output is primarily a NuGet package, and then that's going to have assemblies within it. So uh, NuGet will actually be the primary build output, so that we can then, uh, then NuGet is more of a first-class citizen. Um, how that is then deployed into a hosting environment, Azure websites. I'm not sure. I don't know. So, uh, the question: Can you open 2013 projects in 2015? Yes. Uh, Visual Studio 2015 is not like a. That's not a rewrite by any means. It's just got a whole bunch of new stuff for ASP.NET for next applications. Uh, the project I'm currently working on, I'm using VS 2015 as the primary um, build, uh, primary Visual Studio. Uh, I'm running, it is a web API project, it is in ASP.NET uh, 4.5, I guess that's what it's called. Uh, so it is still on the old site. There's, there's nothing in Visual Studio 2015 you can't load up in the old projects. It's just there's a whole bunch of new tooling support around the new projects. So the things like the nested references, that's only for the new one. Uh, yes, uh, so question was if I didn't include a new package um, that, well, what I can do is open that up in Visual Studio. Uh, so yeah, basically Visual Studio will uh, complain if you don't open a, um, if you're missing dependencies. Uh, let me find that. Uh, there we go. Um, there we go. Uh, I didn't even have a, I didn't have a solution just then. I didn't have a, any kind of star proj file. I just opened my project JSON and it is now happy inside of Visual Studio as a solution. It's worked out that there were two files on disk and all that kind of fun stuff. Oops, I've just opened Outlook. Thanks, Outlook. All right, and that's not what I wanted anymore. Uh, was it? Oh, it was temp three. Thank you. Uh, uh, I don't want to say that actually. Okay, there we go. Okay, so let's open that. Let's comment that out. Okay, so now if I compile, you'll see that I get uh, a whole bunch of compiler warnings. But if we come across, it's telling me that the compiler warnings are because I'm targeting the core framework as well as um, the full framework. So 
this is uh, this is why it's useful to be able to, to list out the multiple frameworks with inside of your project JSON file that you'll be able to see what like what dependencies you've got that are going to have issues as you migrate into the new versions of uh, the .NET platform. And it's so my application is going to my application currently can't run on core CLR until I add a particular reference. I've just opened Outlook again. And we don't need to see my emails on stage. Uh, any other questions? So out of, out of the box, the configuration um, is any files, actually. That's the one that you actually have to take a dependency on the configuration uh, framework inside of uh, your application. So you don't you don't actually get configs out of the box. Uh, if you do want configs or you want the way Microsoft has designed config management, then you have to include a reference, and that reference comes with out of the box support for any files. You can then include a different reference for JSON files. Um, there's a, I think there's one for XML, and I think there's a third one maybe for uh, Azure. Or something like that. Yeah. Unless you even opt into the concept of configuration, you don't have, uh, you don't even have the provider base. Come back. Very good question, and that's something I should have done. So, if I don't have a base class on my controller. Um, do I have a sample of this somewhere to save me trying to flounder around on stage with some code? I'm pretty sure I do. You might notice here, there is this thing called a kprog file. Uh, this is for Visual Studio only. Uh, Visual Studio will add a kprog file to any um, vNext application, and that's just to help MS build. Uh, it's actually very small, it doesn't track files or anything like that, it is just for kind of the tooling support. Um, let's open these three. Because one of these is going to contain what I want. Okay, uh, that's config controller. Here we go. So th this is kind of what you're wanting. If I want, uh, so this is a, um, a base classless uh, controller that I've just created. It's called API controller. Um, I've taken a dependency on this thing called action context. So that's kind of where we'll get things like the requesting routes uh, from. I think it is. Um, yeah, I'm actually not using it. Uh, if I want to send down like JSON results, there's an iAction result helper that will do things like JSON, views, uh, file, that kind of stuff. So yeah, if you don't have a base class, you won't have those um, methods by default. And you won't have uh, requests and responses as properties. Instead, you can them as, as constructed dependencies. So that, that's, that's how you can still get to all of that stuff uh, under the hood. Any other questions? Uh, to be honest, I'm actually not sure what happens if you have a base classless control, if you're using Web API and you just return an object. I think it will do the standard content negotiation that we have in Web API at the moment. I think that's what it falls back to. So even if it's not a base class, it will content negotiate the response down. So, um, yeah, so I'm pretty sure it just falls back to the Anything else, or am I getting kicked off? Uh, thank you, and hopefully, I win an Xbox.